All right. Hey, uh, this is the first Bible study video that uh, I'm posting for this week. Uh, I'm going to be going through Philippians 2, and I've actually broken this down into a couple of parts. So we won't cover the entirety of Philippians 2, but we will jump in today. Uh, I encourage you to be reading this this week. I'll post uh, another part to this study next week, and uh, we can continue on going through Philippians 2 together. Uh, I posted this, uh, or actually, <clears throat> I chose this passage. It was uh, it was just on my heart um, as I prayed. It's it's a chapter of the Bible that has often comforted me, encouraged me, and stirred me up uh, to really just be more like Christ. And um, as I was studying this, something stuck out to me that I hadn't quite seen before. And so uh, I'm going to highlight uh, some things that I saw in here that I really feel like um, God wants us to see. Uh, so if you've got your Bible, let's go ahead and read this together. Starting in verse 1, it says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, sorry, so at the name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah, that is that is a wonderful uh, set of verses there. It's one of my favorite portions of the Bible. Very encouraging. The two intro verses, they're pretty potent, but there's so much jam-packed talking about the humility of Christ and uh, the kind of character that we should have. I think I've just overlooked these things uh, over the years, and but I, I think that they are particularly helpful for us and sharp for us uh, today, and especially in this season where we can't gather together as easily and what are these things that, that Paul is pointing to us? Uh, it's something he gives, uh, if you look at that opening passage, he actually gives very uh, strong encouragement. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, uh, and he, he says, do the, he's basically saying, hey, if you're a Christian, this is for you. What I'm about to say is for you. And it includes the whole that we just read, that whole thing we read. But it also includes this verse 2 that is often... Uh, overlooked. So what is this thing that uh, Paul is is pointing to us? He's commending to us. He's saying, hey, this is for every Christian. This is what it is to be comforted in love and strengthened by Christ and encouraged by Christ. This thing he's emphasizing that we overlook, he says, be of the same mind, have the same love, be in full accord, and be of one mind. <laughs> right? Paul is emphatically encouraging us as a church to be unified, to be together as Christians. Uh, and obviously that's particularly sharp in this time when it's hard for us to gather as Christians, that we're, we're not uh, having our Sunday morning meetings. We're not meeting in mass right now. Um, not Catholic mass. I meant mass like in number. You guys get what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's so important for us as Christians to be uh, united, and I actually think that this idea is—is is, uh, I mean, it's not—it's not a shocker, right? You're not like, oh, wait, God wants Christians to be together. Well, yeah, of course He does. I think what surprises me is that here in Philippians two, this is how He opens. This is how He opens the passage on humility. This is how He opens this wonderful passage that gives us such depth into who Jesus is. He opens by saying. We need to be unified and not just unified. He's emphatic about this. He's repeating this. He's saying of the same mind in one accord, you know, telling us to be uh, together, having the same love. And I just think it's so uh, wonderful. 
On the other side of this, it, it points to us how uh, division is a horrible thing for Christians. Relational strife, you guys know that pain, and hurt are not God's intention uh, for Christians. And it's interesting here uh, as well because he's, he's, he's pointing this out for a reason. Obviously, it's easy. I don't know if you know this, but it's easy to drift from community. If you ever had a friend that you haven't talked to in a while, or if you've ever had a conflict where you never actually talked about the conflict, and then you add distance, it, in our heads, we work out all these things like, oh, what they think these terrible things about me. It's somehow we get farther divided when we're not together with people. Even if, here's the thing, even if you don't talk about that conflict or that issue, if you are actually around that person, the funny thing is, you're not going to feel all this enmity. You're not going to feel all this division. Now, you might feel some resentment. You might have some issues in your heart because you're not facing a conflict that you probably should face. But what's interesting is when you add a conflict plus distance, so often you create this deep division. Um, and this is brutal for Christians, something we want to absolutely avoid. Uh, it reminds me, in the Garden of Eden, it's very interesting. In Genesis 1 through 3, you see this very clear pattern where God creates and he unifies and he joins together, right? Adam and Eve, they're, they're, they're made of the same flesh, you know, it's even, even Adam's first uh, sentence. It's so funny. The first recorded human words in the Bible, it's a love song. It's a love poem. You know, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, this likeness, this similarity, this togetherness in Adam and Eve. And then you see Satan come on the scene and he's trying to separate Adam and Eve from God. He's trying to separate Adam and Eve from one another and he ultimately succeeds, right? And in the, in the beginning, before Satan even comes to the picture, the one thing God said wasn't good was he said, it's not good for man to be alone. People, men and women, we're not meant to be alone. We're meant to exist in community. Um, <clears throat> and Paul's telling us these things because they don't happen by accident. Early in my wife and I's marital counseling, premarital counseling, like when people were counseling us, I remember, uh, I'll never forget, John and Elizabeth Andrews. We were like in St. Louis. We were out of town. We were at some restaurant. We were doing premarital. And I just remember this, I remember this really well. I remember this meeting really well. And uh, one of the things they said was that when they're fighting, when they're they 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 they're arguing, or there's just there's 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 just some some issue, that often one of them will say to the other, "Hey, I'm on your team," and it was just this powerful reminder that we sometimes can feel like everybody's against me, everything's against me, and even within our our marriages, Satan wants that. He wants us to feel as though everyone's against us, and when we get alone, we can those thoughts can really boil up. And, uh, and so we get this advice, and, and it's been so helpful for my wife and I. Just this reminder, hey, just being for one another. Sometimes people don't know it. Hey, like if, you, if you're unsure, like people are for you. And I want you to know this. Like I'm for you. Every person who comes in this church, I am for you. I'm thankful that you're here. I'm glad that you serve. I'm so appreciative of the people that serve at Living Hope Church. I'm so appreciative of those who are staying faithful. I'm appreciative for you uh, for you watching this Bible study. This is us as a leadership trying to lead you and guide you when it's not as easy. You know, it's easier to gather on Sunday and it's built into our life and our patterns. But you know, when you have all the library and Netflix or Dusky's Dusky's, you know, my, I'm sorry, Mike's, uh, Mike's Bible study on YouTube from Living Hope Church. I mean, one of them is high dollar entertainment and the other one's Netflix. <laughs> sorry, you're going to get some bad jokes in these YouTube videos, but you know what I mean? Like there's so many things you can be doing with your time and I'm thankful that you're doing, you're watching this. Uh, and I really, we really do feel like God wants to bless you guys through these things. Um, but sometimes it's so helpful for us just to know people are for us and not against us. So think in your life, like who, who could you remind? Who could you tell? Who could you share and say, hey, I'm for you, right? Do you have a friend you haven't reached out to in a while? Do you have somebody that, that maybe there was a conflict and you, know, you don't have to open with saying, hey, we need to resolve this, uh, but you could open up with friendship and say, hey, I just want you to know I miss you. I love you. I want to be with you. And actually through friendship, through true friendship, real friendship, you actually do end up dealing with most conflicts if you're loving and able to speak the truth in love. Um, so I, I've got a series of questions here that I want to I want to just send your way. And uh, as I ask these questions, you might just pause the video and think about these. If you're in a small group, if you're meeting with other people, if you're with your spouse, you might just discuss these questions briefly amongst yourselves and uh, and just think about it before you continue on. My first question here is, are you a person of unity? 
Um, you know, another way to put this is, do you strive to build connections with other Christians and walk together in the same direction as them? Is that something that's just baked in your I want to be together. You want to fight for togetherness. You want to fight for unity. Why don't you just pause the video here and, uh, and think about that question. Talk about that question for a bit. Being a person of unity doesn't mean that you you just uh, you don't you just go with the flow. You never bring up anything difficult. You never talk about things that 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 are hard to talk about. That's not what it is at all. If actually, that's you're not being a person of unity if you don't ever talk about anything hard. Now, if all you ever talk about are hard things, or all you ever have like the majority of your thoughts are you know challenge thoughts or conflicting thoughts, you might want to reevaluate that and ask yourself, why is that? I do think a part of being uh, unifying, a part of being a community-oriented person, a loving friend, a good friend, um, somebody who exists in community well, is being able to talk about hard things. You know, it doesn't just mean going with the flow. It doesn't mean just laying down every time there's a conflict. It actually means we hash things out. Fighting for unity means we fight to hash things out when there are conflicts, when there are difficulties. Um, and ultimately, it means we let Christ's love unify us when all kinds of other things can divide us, right? There's all kinds of things. This is the, the heart of a Christian is to let the, the unifying love of Christ be the thing that we are most about, you know? And even if, here's the thing, we won't resolve every conflict. Sometimes you're going to be on a different page with other people. It's not a reason to end your relationship with them. It's not a reason. Most things, uh, most, most of our disagreements are not uh, of the most serious matters. Many of our disagreements are on smaller things or less significant things, things that we can live with, we can walk with one another, and actually that the love of Christ can overcome. Uh, so ultimately it means that as a, as a church, we're able to fight for one another and work through conflict. Um, we don't want to be people with to all only conflict, or too much conflict, but we also at the same time don't want to be people who never deal with the things in our heart. We can't hash something out with another um, Christian. Uh, another thing I want to point out that I think is really interesting, in verse 2, it says uh, that Paul, Paul says, you can complete my joy by being unified. I think this is really significant. Uh, I'll get a, I'm going to open up just a little bit for you as pastor you know, of the church. Uh, if you want to know, I'm not crying my eye itches. Okay, don't touch your eyes. Corona, look out. No, it's okay. Uh, if you want to know what your leaders love, or you want to know what I love, you want to know what will complete my joy. It's being unified. Uh, people walking together in love and like-mindedness. Man, it's such a great joy. Us walking together in love and like-mindedness through this uh, this pandemic season, like this weird social season we've never experienced, you know, in my 30 plus years on this earth. Uh, walking together in like-mindedness and unity. Uh, it just, it stirs me up, man, praying this morning with, with the group that we had, the small group of, you know, we had six people here this morning praying at 6 a.m. Wednesday mornings at the church, you should come. There's still room. We're still under the legal limit. Uh, but, you know, just us praying together, it was so powerful and it was wonderful. And I thought, yes, this is what the church uh, should be doing. You know, I want us to grow. Let's get so many people on Wednesday morning that we got to like quarantine to different rooms and pray in num groups of 10, you know. Um, that's, that's, there's a, there's a pastor dream, uh, completing my joy by us having so many prayer meetings at 6 a.m. Uh, but for real, like unity, it, I mean, Paul went through so many things and he's, he's saying, this is a great source of his joy, is that the church would be unified. This is a great source of my joy that you guys, that we together would be unified, fighting for togetherness. Jesus gives us the tools to walk this life, putting others' needs ahead of our own, uh, walking in humility in ways that are powerful and loving and gracious. And Christians who live, like Jesus calls us to live in Philippians 2, are Christians who should be very easily able to walk in unity. Right? Unity and humility are very intrinsically uh, tied together. There's a reason why Paul opens up this humility passage in, in Philippians 2 by talking about unity, because these things are inextricably linked. All right, so I'm going to wrap up this Bible study uh, by talking about uh, what does it look like practically to live our lives in unity? Well, first and foremost, be together. <laughs> so I laugh at that because currently, you know, the St. Joe just passed a ban that you can't get together in groups of more than 10. Um, 
This is going to be on the internet, so I'm not going to say, I'm not going to make any jokes about that. But for real though, be together, show up and actually get together with others, right? It, it might be a little harder, but here's the thing. You can call your friends, call them, talk to them on the phone, use your voice, you know, don't just be on social media chatting or messenger or, or texts, pick up the phone and talk, hear a voice. There's something about that. That's, uh, it's, it's more intimate. It's more personal. It's more meaningful than just text back and forth response. Um, we're also encouraging anyone who isn't sick or in a vulnerable health category or near someone in a vulnerable health category to, to continue to gather together in groups of 10 or less. Uh, do it to watch the Sunday service. The Sunday service is going to go up this Sunday at 9 a.m. And uh, on our YouTube channel, get together with a group of people. Just invite, even if it's just one couple, you know, even if it's just... Um, you know, a handful of people getting together in these groups of 10 or less, watching the service, praying for one another. This is a really great opportunity for you guys to be the church, right? We shouldn't stop just because we're not meeting together in mass doesn't mean we can't meet together in our homes and we should meet together in our homes, right? If you have the option of watching on your own uh, or watching it with other people, watch it with other people. You're going to church together, right? This is still our church. It's your pastor. It's your worship team. It's us together in unity. Um, so continue to gather together in ways that you can, um, even if you have to be a little creative. Uh, another way that we can grow unity, you can build unity, is to serve one another, right? Now, it's great to serve outside of the church, and we definitely should do that. We should be serving our city. We should think of creative ways. How can we serve our city in this time, in this interesting uh, and difficult time? Uh, but in particular, to grow unity in the church, it's great to serve one another. Um, serving your fellow Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a powerful way to grow unity together. Um, a third way we can practically grow unity is to fight for unity, right? If you're not on the same page with somebody, humbly, lovingly talk to them, ask questions. Don't let emotions rule you. You know, sometimes we get angry because of stuff that's said. Sometimes we get angry because of a misunderstanding and we can just let our emotions control us. But, you know, speak the truth in love, right? Let truth, let Christ's truth guide your words as you talk to somebody. Hey, you said this and you know, it really hurt me or, hey, you said this and, and I, this is what I heard. And, and oftentimes someone, if you're in that case and there has been a miscommunication, somebody will say, oh my goodness, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I said it that way. I'm sorry that, that, that was what it sounded like I was trying to say. I wasn't trying to say that. And, and I, you know, it's amazing because I have seen great conflicts between people diffused just by people sorting out the miscommunications. You know, someone heard something that they thought was really intense and the other person didn't intend to say uh, that fight for unity, talk through things. Conflict is a part of being a Christian. The Bible says it, I, like iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So conflict is part of walking with God, but God wants these conflicts to lead to reconciliation and unity and not division. <clears throat> All right, so my last practical tip, uh, don't gossip or build up people's hurts, right? You wanna know something that really messes with unity is when people gossip, right? And, and you're like, well, Mike, what's gossip? I mean, there's a few forms of gossip. You know, probably the easiest one is talking negatively about someone when they're not around with someone else. And it sort of stirs up this fake image or this, this sort of, you know, um, resentment amongst two people. And, and we all know it. Like, the, why do we gossip? We gossip because it feels good, especially if someone's hurt us, especially if we're in the middle of a conflict or miscommunication. We go to somebody and we talk negatively about them and it makes us feel better. And we can convince the other person, yeah, okay, I'm in the right, they're in the wrong, they're messed up, I'm not messed up. Uh, but it is one of the things the Bible actually speaks very poorly of. Uh, it, 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 gossip is a sin. Gossip is something we don't want to do as a church. It's something that's so easy to do, um, and we want to avoid it. That's one kind of gossip is just talking uh, negatively about someone when they're not around with someone else. Um, you know, and another kind of gossip that is maybe a little more dangerous is if you have an open conflict with somebody and you're hashing it out with every other person, but you're not actually talking to the person uh, it, it just, it's such a divisive thing. You can create this island where you have all these people on one side and the other person, the person who wronged you is over here in, you know, in exile, being punished because you feel like you're in the right. Well, the Bible tells us, Bible is a very clear instruction. It says that if you have an issue with someone, if you have a sin with somebody, or, or, like if somebody sinned against you, if somebody's hurt you, if someone's caused an issue uh, for you, the Bible says, go directly to that person. Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, if somebody hurts us or sins against us, we should talk to them first. And then it says that if you can't sort it out, then you can bring in a wider audience. But the goal is reconciliation, not bad mouthing them. And we would recommend asking a leader, a community group leader, a uh, leader in the church to mediate between the two of you, to sit down and, and hash it out with you guys. And I'm going to tell you, almost like the vast majority of these conflicts 
do get sorted out and can be sorted out. And the entirety of my time as a pastor, right? Personally, I like it's like 99% of the personal conflicts, misunderstandings, you know, hurts, sins, whatever, have been sorted out. Like they've been sorted out. Like 99.9% of them, thousands of them sorted out. And a very, very, very tiny handful of things that at the end of the day, we are like, I don't think we can sort this out. So if you're struggling right now, you're angry at somebody, you're, you're having a conflict with someone, uh, pray, pray for them. Pray for them to be blessed. Pray that God would uh, just bless their life richly and your heart will change, right? If you pray positive, like loving, wonderful Christ blessing on people's lives, your heart will change. Prayer that you pray can actually change your heart. It can raise your faith. You know, you're praying, God, grow the church during this pandemic. You know, it sounds crazy. That's what I'm praying. I believe God will raise my faith. You know, God, unify our church during this time we can't meet together. You know, that's going to grow my faith. You know, you pray for somebody that feels far away. God is going to change your heart, soften your heart towards that person. So here's our summary. God is calling us to be a unified people. Uh, He wants us to be together. I'm excited for what that means as a church. As we walk through these difficult times together, we can be knit together in a unique way. God's designed it so that as people walk together faithfully through uncertainty, through difficulty, um, that, that, that our hearts are knit together. We, we bond to people in ways that you can't otherwise bond to them. And it's a powerful and awesome reminder. And I also want to encourage you, like we have this opportunity to enjoy a particularly sweet uh, and intimate kind of community together, personal phone calls, small group gatherings. Let's, let's not um, fret over being upset about what we don't have right now, but let's appreciate the reality that our God is big enough that whether you're meeting with three people, two people, or praying in a room on your own, God can bless you, grow the church, and move your faith forward. That's what we believe at Living Hope, and that's what we believe as a people. And so let's enjoy this season. Let's dive in richly, and let's see what God has for us. You know, don't neglect to meet together. Don't neglect to call one another spend time in community. I'm going to wrap this up by praying for uh, you guys. And um, I want to encourage you to pray together after watching this. Ask each other, how can we pray for one another? And and just pray. Pray these things. If you want to know some things you can pray for, you can pray for unity in the church through this unique season. Two, strength and leadership. Uh, In my personal life, I could use some prayers for my own leadership, navigating this wisely. Uh, And prayer for our church as we try uh, to navigate this faithfully. And then finally, I want you to pray that the church would grow in community, even though that may seem unlikely. Christianity is made for seasons like this. Like, I want you to pray that our church would grow in community while community is particularly difficult. I have faith for that. So I'm going to close this with a prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do just ask that you would bless Living Hope Church. God, I pray that you would bless me and the leadership team as we navigate this season. Lord, we know you have called us. God has prayed this morning, much like the book of Esther said, We were built, we were born for such a time as this. And Lord, I just pray, help us navigate this season, strengthen us as we walk together, unify Living Hope Church, unify uh, the churches of this city. And Lord, I pray that community would grow and that we would walk together through this hardship, through this season, and our hearts would be knit together in a more powerful way. God, I pray that at the end of all this, when we gather together again, we would we would see it for what it really is, a sweet and wonderful gift that we can gather in, uh, in large groups together to worship your name and hear from the word. But in the meantime, I pray, help us relish and enjoy this sweet intimacy of small groups and personal relationships with one another. Jesus, I pray you bless us in your name. Amen.